The young man on the floor in those pictures, he is my current guru. I go to him for everything I need to know in a hurry, because he has all the answers. <laughs> Recently, he was at my home and uh, having a lemonade. He comes to my house for a lemonade and cocoa. And we went outside, we were sitting on the lawn, and my wife was there and his sister, and it was right after his seventh birthday, and I had bought him some giant box of uh, Legos. One that had eight packages in it. And he had told me beforehand, I've never had one with more than two packages. And he says, this says for eight-year-old to 12. And I said, you can handle it. And he looked at me and said, yeah, I know. <laughs> and by the way, he built it in a day. But he was laying there and he said, you know, I'm really happy right now. And I said, well, that's good. He says, you know, I have just about everything I want. And there was a pause, and he said, except for Legos and more chocolate. <laughs> and I thought to myself, when was the last time my bubble was that simple? You know, and I said, yeah, this is the guy i got to listen to because he will keep me grounded. He has... One day I took and we made a, a really neat Christmas ornament for his mother. He and his sister, I made a frame. We put um, uh, pine cones all up and down it and we got the spray and we sprayed it with fake snow. We had to go get some ornaments and we were in Michael's and he disappeared and I got nervous. You know, you got somebody's kid and he disappears. And, <laughs> He came running back to me, and he had this ornament that was about that big. And I said, well, Miles, I said, that's way too big, and it's really expensive. And he looked at me, and he said, Lenny, why do you want to keep all your money? <laughs> so yesterday, I spoke to a class of uh, photography students at Palomar College. And I, it was a favor, and you know, it's just talking photography. That's pretty easy to do if you've been doing it for 40-something years. But it took a lot longer than I thought, and then I had a bunch of errands to do. I'm going on a trip in about 10 days to Italy, and I, uh, I had a million things to get done, and I had to deliver photos. One of the things I do with my, my pictures when I'm not working them, and some of them aren't journalism pictures, some are, some are just art stuff, I give them to charities, they auction them off. And I had a couple of these committees that I'm not even on, but I had to deliver the pictures. And I didn't get home until 8.30, 9 o'clock. And I said, Jesus, you know, I haven't even printed my notes. It's not even finished. So I started working on that. And as I worked on it, I looked at the computer clock, and it was 10.30, it was 11 o'clock, it was 11.15. I said, okay, i got to go to bed. So I went in the kitchen, get a glass of water, and... While I was in there, I saw this newspaper, which I think I have in my pocket. It's the Wall Street Journal from yesterday. And I figured my wife had left it for me because it was a baseball story. And I like baseball. But after I looked at it for a while, I saw a headline that said, How to stay calm, poised, when the spotlight is on you. And I said, how timely. <laughs> and I grabbed it, and it was about, and I don't know this woman, but I'm sure some of you do, uh, Melissa Wilhelmina Cooper, the brand officer for Wil Wilhelmina Models. And I started to read it, and the first thing it said was, what you need to do the night before, get a good night's sleep. <laughs> I said, well, we lost on that one. And it went on about getting exercise before you go and all that. It didn't, uh, I didn't do any of those things, but it said one other thing. And can I ask you your name? Lindsay. Lindsay, it says down here, always have somebody you can rely on when you're in the spotlight if something goes wrong. <laughs> so 
So when I lose track of where I was, I'm going to ask you where I was, okay? <laughs> you, got, you got that job. All right, so let's get uh, to humility. The first thing I'm going to tell you is that uh, when this first chain of emails started, and it, it said, uh, you know, I want to introduce you to someone and this and that, and I said, they want you to talk, and I thought, well, how hard can that be? And I didn't actually get any farther than that. I said, okay, this is about three weeks before today. And then uh, another email came and it said, we have a theme for our speakers. Well, that was kind of like a red light going on. You know, I said, I thought I was going to just talk pictures. And it says, the theme is humility. And I just started laughing. I mean, I just... <laughs> I mean, if I was doing a resume, humility would not be listed as one of my strong characters. <laughs> so, anyway, um, this went back and forth, and I thought, well, you know, I've got a few days. I think I'll think about it before I try to make any notes. And I'm a lot older than most of you. There's a few of you up there. When you start thinking about these things, you go back. I mean, you go right back into your high school days and things, and you start thinking about everything people had told you about various ideas. And I went through this and went through it, and I said, you know, I think I need to do something. Because as I think about humility, I said, let's see. A great artist, Andrea Bocelli. Everybody knows who he is. Phenomenal singer. Great artist. Very humble person. The Rolling Stones would not be the Rolling Stones if we all thought of Mick Jagger as a humble person full of humility. And I said, you know, there's contradictions here. And I've got to figure out the contradictions before I can get anywhere on this. And so I did the stupid thing that humans do. I went to the dictionary. And in the dictionary, there are definitions which are part of the dumbing down of the human race. And I'm serious. And I will get to one of them here. You know, I got into this thing, and it said things like uh, uh, humility. And it got in where it, it said that humility was the act of being humble. <laughs> now, I did a lot of reading once. Uh, about, from a philosopher named Emmanuel, I never say his last name right, but it's uh, Levinas. He was a Lithuanian in the 20th century, died in 1995 at 95 years old. And he wrote about justice. And when you go to the dictionary and you look up justice, it says the character of being just. And I, I say to myself, I don't care if it's a teacher or, or a dictionary or someone you know, when you use a derivative of the word in the definition, you should be locked up. It should be a crime. And when you, when you get into humility, it says things, and I, I'd like to get it exact if I could ever even find it on here, but it says things like uh, synonyms, lowliness, meekness, submissiveness. Really? I, it didn't... It said this cannot be. I mean... I don't see this in humble people. Who's one of the most humble people we all have ever heard of? Would it be Gandhi, maybe? Uh, Gandhi owned nothing. He had no possessions. And yet, as humble as he was, you would never call him meek. You would never call him submissive. He sent one of the biggest world powers out of his country without a without a war, all right? People who do that aren't meek. They aren't submissive. So I decided, okay, what's the meaning of humility? And I went into my old days. I went to a public school for six years. After that, I went to a Catholic junior high school, a Catholic high school, and I had the Jesuits teach me through college at Marquette. I mean, it's like 17 years of school, and I didn't know what humility meant. 
Uh, and what did, how did Dylan say? 20, 20 years of schooling, and they put you on the day shift? You know, that's the way, that's the way I kind of felt about it. And I, I said, i got to know more. So I went to the Latin. And the Latin derivative of the humility is a word that you will find called humilis. And humilis comes from a word humus. And what does humus mean? It's the Latin word for earth. And I, when, I, when I read it, I started scratching my head. I said, how are we going to get from earth over here? Until I realized that those people, those students of the language, the philosophers of those days, they didn't think of the earth as something that spun around and went around the sun and all that because they didn't know it. Earth was dirt. It was the simplest, plainest thing there was. It wasn't adorned. It was earth. It was the truth. You couldn't deny earth. It is what it is. And as far as they were concerned, this equaled honesty because it could not be seen in any other sense. And that is actually, and you can probably find somebody that disagrees, but that, the history that I read on it now, this is a derivative of humility, and we get back to honesty. Now, honesty in art, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't, I don't think it means that I don't take your head and put it on his shoulders and stick you in a group of people somewhere in a picture. You know, it, it, it's, not, it's not that kind of honesty. It's being honest to your work, to your craft, to your efforts. That, in my case, is when I looked at this, is what humility actually means. And, you know, it's like the word justice in the same sense. If I ask you what's the difference in justice, you'd do better than the dictionary, I hope, and you wouldn't say it's the act of being just. But what is it? Well, you know, mankind has had one struggle from day one. Can't help himself. Trying to find a meaning of life. Some of us might think we have it. Some of us think we never have it. Some of us have religious influences, and I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm just saying you have your own way of getting there. But when you come to the, a conclusion that you have value, there's only one step you can go from there. And that's, that's a universal value. It, you can't be the only one that has value and everybody else doesn't. Unless you're the opposite of humility, and that means you're arrogant. And uh, what Levinas came to the conclusion of is that if we all have value, it's like almost like in our Constitution, uh, inalienable rights, everybody has them. Well, you have to come to the conclusion at least that what justice is, the defiant, has nothing to do with fairness or anything. It's an obligation. It's an obligation everyone has to everybody else. And I bring that into this because when we talk about honesty in our work, you don't have simply that obligation to yourself. You have that obligation to anybody who's going to see your art, who's going to see your efforts. And if you're not honest in those efforts, you're not going to produce good art. When we produce anything, pictures, designs, paintings, one of the underlying reasons we do this is to communicate. And you cannot communicate properly without humility. I mean, I just said the opposite of humility would be arrogance. And what is arrogance but to put yourself in front of of everybody else, of everything else. It's all about you. And humility and honesty is only possible if you communicate that. So I have solved at least my contradictions, and that's because Andre Bocelli and the Rolling Stones both communicate quite well. And they're honest to their work. Now, there are varying ways to look at words, 
And I think I still have that little doohickey. Where is it? Right here. It'll never work, but we'll try. There's the first picture right there. I took this picture, uh, got early 90s. I got this phone call that said, hey, Mike Tyson. Mike Tyson is being charged with rape. And he's going to have to go to Indianapolis for his arraignment. So I, I jumped on an airplane and I flew to Las Vegas. And I think they told me to go there because I had once worked there and I knew my way around. And I got in the car and I drove over to Las Vegas Country Club's gated community because I, I knew Tyson had a place there. Couldn't get through the gate. And, you know, I'm a pretty good talker to these security guys and all that, but I couldn't get in. And I looked everywhere. I went over to the uh, charter airport. I was looking for Don King's airplane. Everybody knows who Don King was, the famous boxing promoter and criminal. And <laughs> Don did not have an airplane there. So I drove over to the main airport, which was a lot smaller than it is today. And I went to U.S. Air that had a hub in Indianapolis. And I waited for this long line of people to check in. And then I walked up to the young lady behind the counter. I didn't lie to her. I told her who I was. I was Associated Press photographer. And when I need to find Mike Tyson, and I need to make a picture of him. She says, can you tell me if he's on that flight at 8 o'clock to uh, Indianapolis? And she said, I can't tell you that. She says, I can't tell you what the manifest says. She says, that's against all the rules. And I sat there and leaned against her counter, I should say, and I talked to her and Asked her how things were at U.S. Air. You know, took, I could make friends with her. And she still wouldn't give it up. So as I, I started to walk away, I said, tell you, don't tell me anything about Tyson. How about Mr. King? Is he on the plane? She looked down at her computer. She said, my God, there's six Mr. Kings in first class. <laughs> so I said, all right. And I looked up at the board and it said, gate, whatever. I did my homework, and this wasn't going to be till nighttime. I could have, you know, gone and had a nice lunch, but I, I did my homework. This is before 9-11, so you could walk through security pretty easy. And I went down all the terminals. It's a long, long walkway. If you've been in that airport, there's all these big backlit uh, transparencies advertising, you know, Hallelujah Hollywood, Caesar's Palace, you name it. And then there's this one, which... You can read, or oh, maybe you can't from in the back. Folks, it says, the average rapist, I can't read that for myself. The average, <laughs> the average rapist gets about three and a half years. Most victims get life. And I said, gee, how convenient. <laughs> I didn't put the sign there. I didn't tell Mike to go to Indianapolis on that flight. So that night, when everybody, TV found out, and everybody else, and there's a mass of people, and they're all, I don't know what you call it, but it's the, uh, the back step, you know, where you're, you're shooting video or stills, and you're backing up and backing up, and if you're a camera guy, you've got somebody pulling your belt so you don't trip over anything. And I shot him coming through security, and I just took off. And I went down and all the way, and I stood to the side, and here came the herd. And they came, and they came, and as they all walked by me, none of them could see that. They didn't know it. I just stepped in, fired a frame or two, and I got that picture. Now, I think I did my job right. I had uh, major disagreements. When I sent that picture, and I had to send it, this is before digital, I had to go to Darkroom. I used the Las Vegas Review Journal's Darkroom. I made the print, I typed out the caption, stuck it on the picture, and I sent it to New York. And the New York editor said, I can't run this picture. And I said, what, did you lose your fingers? I said, push the button. He says, I can't do that. He says, I'm going to catch hell. Yeah, so what? That's what we do in this business. He goes, well, how did this happen? <laughs> and I went right back through the whole thing again. I said, hey, I didn't put him there. I didn't put the sign there anyway. Well, he wasn't going to run it. And the editor-in-chief of that newspaper was a gentleman named Sherm Frederick, who when I started off in 1973 at that newspaper, Sherm was the religion writer. And I knew him well. 
We had a famous incident, in fact, when the newspaper sent me, I was out on a hostage situation, they wanted me to leave, and they said, Sherm takes pictures once in a while, go on out there, Sherm, and give, have Lenny give you one of his cameras, for he can go shoot some society thing. And when Sherm showed up and told me that, I, you know, he's a nice kid, but I kind of laughed, and I gave him the film I had already shot, I put it in his hand, I said, take it to Kmart, they've got goof-proof picture service, and get the hell out of here. But Sherm and I became pretty good friends. And Sherm came out of his office at 8.30 at night. He knew it because this was a big story. And he looked at my picture and he goes, oh, that's going to be awesome. <laughs> and I said, well, Sherm, AP won't let me send it. I mean, they won't put it out. He said, just a minute. And he walked into his office, waved to me. I walked in. He called the head of AP Photos. By this time, it's like 10 o'clock at night or whatever. You know, the plane was leaving at 8. So it's 1 o'clock in the morning in New York. And he calls the head of AP Photos at home. And he says, I want this picture. And the boss says, what picture? You're, you know, you're a member of the AP. AP, is, by the way, for those who don't know, it's a nonprofit co-op. It's the biggest news organization in the world, but it's a nonprofit co-op. So he is not a client, he's a member. And Sherm says, hey, I pay my bills. I want that picture. And the guy says again, I don't know what picture you're talking about. I'll call you back. And he, he calls the office and the, the guy in New York at the time who answered the phone and who I talked to tells him about the picture. And our boss comes, calls back and, and you know, he's I don't know which one. I think it's arrogance. I'm sorry. Uh, his arrogance tries to say that, you know, he can dot the I's and cross the T's on morality, on ethics, and everything else. And he finally said to this guy, you can have the picture. Can you hold off publishing it for a little while? I said, no problems, but I'm owning this picture. Now, the time I left there, I went to a bar, of course, um, <laughs> where a lot of the writers and other guys hung out. They, I had the copy of the print, and I showed it to them. And within, I don't know, two or three hours, I'm in my hotel room, and the phone rings, and it's the editor from uh, some horrible tabloid, I can't think of which one, National Enquirer or something. says, I'll give you 10000 for that picture. I said, how do you know about this picture? He goes, oh, my writer was in the bar, and he told me about it. He described it. I've got to have it. I can't give it to you. Says, First of all, I don't want my pictures in your paper. Secondly, I don't own it. I work for AP. They own me. They have my soul. I, I can't give it to you. 20000 I was saying, well, you're ways off. I'm not going to throw away my job, you know, for getting one picture up. My phone started ringing, and it rang most of the night, and finally the boss called me up. And he goes, I should tell you what kind of trouble you're in because my phone hasn't stopped ringing since your buddy called. I've had a call from Sports Illustrated people. I've had a call all these people. I said, that should only tell you one thing. This is what's that. It's a damn good picture. <laughs> and I didn't make it. I didn't, it's not staged. It's an honest picture. And he goes, yeah, but it, it really has too much innuendo in it. You know? And I said, I don't know about you. I said, you know, I try to be as objective as I can as a journalist. But there are certain situations, and it's something I learned way, way back in the early 80s when I used to go to Latin America for revolutions. And a friend of mine there, or a guy who became my friend, said to me, here's how you go to these places. You go in objectively. You look around, and you figure out who's the good guy and who's the bad guy. And then you stomp on the bad guy. Well, you know, that may not be the best journalism uh, <laughs> principle, but I didn't think I did anything wrong there. No. So uh, that picture ended up getting published, finally, when he was convicted. Then my friend Sherm Frederick made sure it got published because he said, this picture should get published no matter what at some point. It was an ethical question, but I do think, as we talk about honesty and all, I didn't break the rules. Now, I might have stretched it a little. I might have said, you know, I've got, uh, I'm foreseeing the future. 
And uh, that's why I said, oh, you changed it for me because I hadn't pushed the button. <laughs> Everybody know who that is? Tommy Lasorda. I should like Tommy Lasorda. I love baseball, and I'm Italian. Now, I can tell you that Tommy Lasorda, and I don't care if Tommy gets to see this, is one of the worst human beings I've ever met in my life. <laughs> I have never met a man with a fouler mouth than this man. The first time I encountered him, one of my first years here, the last game of the season, the Padres had Fan Appreciation Day, and this quiet little man named Bob Chandler, who was a wonderful guy, went out to home plate with a great big drum with ticket stubs in it. And if you pulled out your ticket, you might have got a TV, and the last thing was a car and all that. And while he sat there and pulled out the prizes and announced them, his team, Tommy's team, had already gone into the locker room because the Padres had just ruined the end of their season, beating them like three days in a row. And Tommy sat in that exact chair, actually, yelling at poor little Bob Chandler, calling him every name you could think of, and believe me, he broke every F-bomb record there was. And I said, this is not a good guy. I mean, you know, I would have thought, because I didn't know better. I didn't know Tommy was sort of time. Should be a better guy. So a couple years later, the Dodgers are in town in the late April. They had just won the world championship the year before. Padres sweep them. And on Sunday afternoon, Tommy's sitting in that chair, takes his hat off, puts his hand on his head like this. I'm on the first base side of Long Lens. I shoot his picture. And the LA Times in the Herald Examiner run this picture this big. They slug it, world champion headache. <laughs> the next time the Dodgers are in town, Vince Campagnon, great photographer from the LA Times, he goes behind home plate, which is to Lasorda's right there, to shoot through a window to shoot the picture. There was these little holes with netting you could shoot the picture. Lasorda starts screaming at him because he was sure that's where I had made this picture. When, in, you know, if you had a brain at all, you could tell that the guy had to be down first base. So every time I saw Tommy Lasorda, I said, I'm going to get him. <laughs> so one year, I'm doing a day baseball game, and I'm shooting in the photo box on third base, which is about 90 feet to Lasorda's left. And before the game really gets going, some guy comes down the stairs. And he leans over the railing, because the stands were above the dugouts. And he leans and he says, Lasorda, you're the worst manager you've ever been in the league. You absolutely stink. And Lasorda turns around and immediately starts to F-bomb the guy. You know, yeah. Guy goes away. A couple innings later, the guy comes down the aisle over to the side. Lasorda, when are you going to make your big mistake today? Lasorda starts yelling at him. Sixth inning comes up. Padres are losing by one run, as I remember. They got a man on base. Maybe it was, no, it was two runs. Man on base. And Lasorda walked, and I don't even know who the guy was, but he intentionally walked the guy. The pitch to Phil Plantier, who's still a local, by the way. And Phil hit a three-run homer. Padres take the lead, go on to win the game. Goes around the bases, stadium starts to quiet down, and all of a sudden over the railing is that guy. Nice move, Tommy! Lasorda goes bananas. I mean, he calls this guy every derogatory thing you could think of. And this didn't stop. People are grabbing their children and leaving. <laughs> I'm sitting there with a 400 millimeter lens, and I'm just shooting Lasorda. I mean, he's just going, this is film days now, right? i got to reload. I only get 36 frames. <laughs> and I'm shooting, and Lasorda sees me. And now he starts screaming at me. He wants to fight me. He wants me to go underneath the stands and fight him. <laughs> Bill Russell, who had been a Dodger player and was then their, one of their coaches, He's grabbing Lasorda, a couple other coaches grab him, they push him back to his chair. Russell comes over to me because I'm not stopping. I'm just reloading. Even if I never process it, I'm going to shoot. <laughs> Russell comes over and 
He says to me, you got to have enough pictures. I says, you know, it kind of depends on how you look at it. For far as I'm concerned, I may never have enough. He goes, I know he's a jackass. I said, can I quote you? <laughs> he says, please, for me, as a favor. Well, next thing I know, I mean, the press box is looking down. What's going on? The game's over. Padres sent people down. Hey, what was going on down there? And I tell them the whole story. And they said, would you do us a favor? Would you write a note to Leonard Coleman, the president of the National League? He says, because our phones are ringing off the wall from people that left the game with their kids because they didn't want their kids to hear this. I don't know how much, but I was told that Mr. Lasorda received a hefty fine. Every time he came to the game after that, he would walk out there and he'd just look around. And, you know, I just, I wanted to go up to him finally one day and say, you know, well, we're going to eat the stands and settle this, but uh, that never happened. Okay, hold on. Or do I do it? There you go. Now, you got to love that. George Bush in a lip lock. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's, it's like that dictionary thing.